Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And this is our, our third talk on the series on arithmetic statistics. And before we get started, let me remind you that there's a survey about the previous talk on Sato Tate distributions. And I'll put that survey link in the chat window. And today we're very happy to have um, Joseph Silverman speaking on moduli problems and moduli spaces in algebraic dynamics. And I'd also like to thank Max Weinreich in advance for providing the closed captions on the video of today's talk. And before we get started, um, Joe, is it okay if we video this, this talk of yours? Sure. Yeah, we'll take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak and thank you everyone for showing up. So what I wanna talk about are moduli problems um, that are sort of a mix of problems in algebraic dynamics and algebraic geometry. Um, and this talk is very much meant to be sort of survey introduction. Um, so uh, I apologize in advance for anyone who's sort of been already an expert in this. Okay, so there are lots of interesting mathematical objects that, that people study, um, among the ones that I'm sure people in the audience have studied are, for example, elliptic curves or higher dimensional abelian varieties um, or curves of higher genus or more complicated surfaces like K3 surfaces or other sorts of varieties. Um, one can fix a variety such as PN and look at its subvarieties. Uh, one can fix a variety such as PN and look at K tuples of points. And then um, as we all know, once you have objects, it's interesting to look at maps between them. So one can look at all the maps between two given objects, for example, algebraic varieties, or um, in dynamics, one often takes a single object and look at, looks at a map from that object to itself, since we can iterate that. And um, I mean, I could have gone on and on with this list, obviously, there are a lot of things that we study. So the primary topic that I'm going to talk about is dynamics, which is all about iteration of maps. So we'll be looking at a map from an object to itself so that we can iterate it. Whoops. And um, especially, I'll be especially uh, concentrating on maps from projective space to itself. And I keep hitting the wrong advanced button. Sorry. OK. So how do we study mathematics? Well, one way to do something interesting is to take your favorite object of type T, for example, your favorite elliptic curve, and prove some interesting stuff about that object. But another way to, to do mathematics is to take the whole class of objects you're interested in and try to prove general properties that hold for all of the objects, like every elliptic curve has such and such a property. For example, the Mordell-Bay theorem has that, um, has that uh, flavor. Every elliptic curve, the group of rational points is finitely generated. Um, so to prove a theorem of that second type, what we should do is look at all of the objects of our particular type T, for example, all elliptic curves or all abelian varieties or all morphisms from PN to PN. Um, so I said the set of such things, and I know those aren't actually sets, they're too big, but I'm gonna ignore that. Um, in any case, there are the, these collections or sets or whatever you wanna call them are huge. There are lots and lots of abelian varieties. There are lots of morphisms from various projective spaces to itself. So we narrow our focus and look at certain subsets. Um, for example, there are too many abelian varieties in some sense to look at all of them. So let's fix the dimension that gets us down. And people frequently then just look at abelian varieties say with a principal polarization that's been fixed. Or, in, in PN, there are lots and lots of different kinds of varieties. So maybe we would look at all the sub varieties of a fixed dimension and a fixed degree, which leads to the notion of Hilbert varieties, Hilbert schemes. 
Um, and there are also an awful lot of maps from PN to PN. So one might restrict, say, to finite maps and fix the degree of the map. Um, and it's also often helpful to add some structure. So for example, if we're going to look at the set of all elliptic curves, we might also throw in a point of order n and look at the pairs e comma p, where e is an elliptic curve, p is a point of order n. Or more closely related to what we'll be well, what I'll be talking about, instead of just looking at the maps from projective space to itself, I might also throw in a point. So I look at pairs consisting of a map and a point, say where the point is a fixed point of the map. Um, however, there is also an issue that there are kind of too many objects in some sense because a lot of them are kind of the same, right? I mean, even for an elliptic curve, if you, Right, I mean, elliptic curve. So it's just a curve of this form. But even if you're, um, work, even if you're just working over a particular field or whatever, you get an isomorphic elliptic curve, one with identical properties, if you put a u to the fourth and a u to the sixth in. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to look at all of the objects we're interested in up to isomorphism. Or, well, I said equivalence here, but equivalence in, in the category you're working in. So again, as examples, and what I'm trying to do is give you a lot of examples before concentrating on the specific objects uh, that, that I want to study, um, just to try to fit what I'm going to do later into a much wider class of this is what mathematicians tend to do in a lot of situations. So for example, we classify a billion varieties up to isomorphism. Or we could say two a billion varieties are equivalent if they're isogenous. So a billion varieties up to isogeny also a very, very interesting um, category. Um, for varieties, normally you at the very least you want to take isomorphic varieties to be the same, but you might classify them up to birational isomorphism, also very interesting. One way to study a particular variety X is to look at the set of all maps from X to P1, except if you change your coordinates on P1, it's really the same map. So you would look at all the maps from X to P1 up to changing the map by an automorphism of P1. Um, or well, in dynamics, there's something similar. So we're going to look at maps. I'm going to concentrate on maps from Pn to Pn. But in general, from, say, a variety to a variety, so I can iterate. Um, and I want to classify them up to dynamical equivalence, where dynamics means studying iteration of the maps. So what kind of equivalence would make the maps behave the same when I iterate? Um, so starting now sort of with the main uh, topic of the talk, I wanna look at dynamical systems. And an abstract dynamical system is simply a pair consisting say of an object in your category or say a set X and a map from X to itself. Um, so a morphism in whatever category you're interested in. And dynamics is the study of the iterates of F. So uh, I'm going to just write F to the nth power to mean F composed with itself n times. Uh, so typically X would be a set, F would be a function. Of course, a set with some extra structure and a function with certain properties. And sort of the most basic property and basic problem in dynamics is to classify the points of X according to their forward orbits under iteration of F. So the forward orbit of a point is just you start with little x, you take F of X, then F squared of X, then F cubed of X, and so on. And I mean, this set may be infinite, it may be finite, so all sorts of different possibilities. 
However, the dynamics uh, really won't change if you change coordinates on X, but you need to do the coordinate change compatibly with iteration, which means you need to do the, the coordinate change simultaneously on both copies of X. Um, so two dynamical systems on X, so F and G that are maps from X to itself, we'll say are, they're dynamically equivalent if they differ by a conjugation by an, of an automorphism of X. And again, what automorphism means depending on what the allowable isomorphisms are from X to itself. So I'll, I'll write, this is sort of a standard notation, F, F super phi for F conjugated by this automorphism phi. So phi inverse F phi. And the reason that's a good notion of equivalence is really because of this, that if you conjugate F and take the nth iterate, that's the same thing as taking the nth iterate and then conjugating, and that, that's obvious just, just writing it down. And it simply comes down to the fact that this square is commutative. And the orbits under the conjugate are also the same in some sense. I mean, they get shifted a little bit. What happens is the orbit of X, if you apply phi inverse to it, gives you the the F phi orbit of phi inverse of X. Anyway, so, so the orbits match up back and forth. You, you can uh, identify them. And actually we've been doing this ever since uh, taking linear algebra, whenever you took linear algebra, right? I mean, one of the big problems in a basic linear algebra class is to classify linear operators or equivalently uh, matrices up to change of coordinates. And the change of coordinates on a linear operator, you need to do that change of coordinates simultaneously on the domain in the range. So what you're really doing, you're classifying matrices, which you can think of as maps, of course, um, up to conjugation by invertible matrices. And that would be an example, in fact, of what I'm going to talk about, except for this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about nonlinear maps instead of linear maps. OK, so this is what we want to do now. We want to describe all the objects in our category, abelian, principally polarized abelian varieties or degree D maps on, from projective space to itself, up to equivalence, up to isomorphism. And one gets a set of equivalence classes, right? I mean, in some sense, that's what equivalence, an equivalence relation does. It breaks your set up into disjoint, a disjoint union of subsets. But it would be nice if the set of equivalence classes itself had some nice structure. And this is a um, standard theme in, in modern mathematics. Um, I was going to say the first example, pr probably one of the first examples people see is if you look at all elliptic curves, but you want them up to isomorphism, say over an algebraically closed field, then the isomorphism classes of elliptic curves are identified just with the affine line uh, via the J invariant. And the affine line is, I mean, is, it's an algebraic variety, right? A nice, smooth, really, really simple algebraic variety. More generally, and much less obvious, the isomorphism classes of principally polarized abelian varieties of a fixed dimension are naturally identified with an algebraic variety, which I've written A sub G here, um, whose dimension is G, G plus one over two. And similarly, well, actually the th thing I wanna stress here is that algebraic variety, it's clear there's, there's a set there, but it has a natural structure as an algebraic variety. So for dynamics, what I want to do is I want to look at the set of all maps of degree D from PN to PN, but I want to identify two of them if they're dynamically equivalent. In other words, there's a conjugation by an automorphism of PN and put a nice structure on that. <clears throat> 
and that's where we're going to go. So I'm going to concentrate for probably most of the talk on dynamics on the projective line, mostly because the, the notation's easier. But at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll mention how everything gets generalized to the higher dimensions. OK, so we want to look at all rational maps from P1 to itself of a fixed degree D. Well, a rational map of degree D just looks like a quotient of polynomials. Um, and what determines the map, of course, is all these coefficients. So there's 2D plus two coefficients to determine the map. But the first observation is that if we multiply the numerator and the denominator by a non-zero constant, we get the same map, right? So if I multiply by a constant everywhere here, I get the same, a non-zero constant, I get the same map. So really, the map is determined by a point in projective space, namely the homogeneous, the homogeneous point given by the coefficients of the polynomials defining F. And I picked a particular order for the coefficients. Second observation, it's not true that every quotient like this is a map of degree D. For example, if a sub d and b sub d were both zero, I could cancel z and I'd get a map of degree d minus one or smaller. So in order to ensure that f has exact degree d, I need to insist that the numerator and the denominator have no common roots, which, I mean, the nice way to do that is to use the resultant. So the map F will have degree D if and only if the resultant of the numerator and the denominator is not zero. And there's a little bit of, uh, you have to be a little bit careful because I haven't written stuff in homogeneous coordinates. So A zero and B zero are not allowed to both be zero either. One thing to note here before moving on is that this resultant not being equal to zero, the resultant itself is this horrible polynomial in the A's and the B's, but it is a polynomial. So we get a polynomial condition for this map F to have degree exactly D. Third observation is that the dynamics is the same if I simultaneously change coordinates where I've misspelled coordinates um, on the domain in the range. Just the, the same thing I was talking about doing before, but in this particular setting, I, I'd use an automorphism of P1. Well, what are the automorphisms of P1? They're linear fractional transformations. And the map F and its conjugate F phi, where I conjugate by this linear fractional transformation, their dynamics are essentially the same. So I want to consider F and F phi to be identical, or I want to consider F to be equivalent to all of its PGL2 conjugates. Okay, so what is this action? Think about, we have a linear fractional transformation and it's acting on the coordinates of F. And if you think about it a little bit, you'll see that, that the action is a linear map on the coefficients of F. So what we essentially have is we end up, and this is the first point, it starts to get um, maybe a little bit, um, I don't wanna say unclear, but, but, but a, a little bit different maybe from what some people are used to seeing. Um, we get a map from the group of linear fractional transformations to the automorphisms of 2D plus two tuples where the 2D plus two tuples are the coefficients of the polynomials defi defining F. So if I write F as F sub AB where capital A, uh, boldface A and boldface B is just shorthand for all those coefficients. Then when I apply phi to F, 
I'll get a new, um, a new um, map of degree D whose coefficients will be a 2D plus 2, 2D plus 2 tuple, a uh, tongue twister. Um, and that's how our rho sub phi is kind of acting on A and B. Okay, so hopefully that's somewhat clear, but I'm gonna write out an example. If I take a map of degree two and I apply a, a linear transformation, a linear fraction transformation, phi to it, then that phi will take the six coordinates of an F and map them to six new coordinates. Well, what does F look like? Okay, well, F is A0Z squared plus A1Z plus A2 over B0Z squared plus B1Z plus B2. But I'm really thinking of it as simply being this point in P5. I hope you can, can kind of read my scribbles. Um, so if I apply this linear fractional transformation by conjugating this map F, I'll get a new quadratic polynomial divided by a quadratic polynomial. So I'll get six new coefficients and they'll be related to these original coefficients by basically just taking this six tuple and hitting it with a six by six matrix. So what does the six by six matrix look like? It looks like that. Okay, so in principle, all of this is completely explicit. Um, needless to say, writing it out, well, actually this, this one you can actually more or less do by hand, um, but pretty soon you will wanna use a computer algebra system. Um, anyway, it is kind of a mess. And this is the simplest non-trivial case because I don't wanna look at maps of degree one on P1. So maps of degree two. All right, so to sort of really in this case, what I want to do is I want to look at the space of all six tuple, homogeneous six tuples. So I want to look at the points in P5 modulo the action of all the elements of PGL2 as they're embedded in PGL6. So I'm essentially taking the quotient of PGL, um, sorry, of P5 by this somewhat strange action of PGL2. Not strange, but complicated. And needless to say, I get a set. That's not a problem. But do I get something nice? Do I get a nice variety? Well, in fact, that quotient that I just wrote at the bottom of the slide is not a nice quotient in any particular sense. But um, I don't actually want to take all of the six tuples on that previous slide or, or all of the PD 2D plus two, right? Because um, remember this, this numerator here is P 2D plus one. And I'm modding out, right? Actually, but it actually isn't. I'm cheating. I'm taking away the resultant locus, and that actually turns out to be really important because once we do that, we will we will get a good quotient. Okay, so that's what I wrote on the other side here. It's p two d. Um, huh. It's 2D plus one here, not 2D plus two. Oh, well, um, modulo the action of PGL2. So I'm gonna define the quotient space at the top of the page there, where again, every place you see 2D plus two mean 2D plus one, um, to, to be this quotient. Uh, and this is, this is called the moduli space of degree D maps on P1. And first theorem, it's actually true, is that this quotient space has a very natural structure as an algebraic variety. 
Um, and in the simplest case, the one where I wrote it out explicitly for you a, a minute or so ago, um, the quotient is actually really nice. It's, it's just the affine plane. That's highly non-obvious. You're, you're taking P5, you're modding out, you're taking P5, you're throwing away a hypersurface, you're modding out by an action of PGL2. And it turns out the quotient is A2. And in general, um, these quotients are not affine space, but they're birational to, uh, to, to projective space. Um, so I, I sort of gave credit to various people here. So, so, so Milner proved A and B over the complex numbers, and I kind of extended it to, to schemes. And part C here is due to Alan Levy. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep the talk at a reasonably low level. But for, for those who know some more algebraic geometry, um, where I say it has a natural structure as an algebraic variety, what it actually is, it exists as a geometric quotient scheme. Um, and in fact, a geometric quotient scheme over spec Z uh, in the sense of geometric invariant theory. All right. So you may remember at the beginning when I was talking about what sorts of things we might study, rather than just studying, say, elliptic curves, we might study an elliptic curve with a marked point of a torsion point of, of order n. Or we might study a map with a marked fixed point. That's a more dynamical kind of thing to do. So that's what I want to do now. The classical example is to study elliptic curves with a marked point of exact order n. And again, I mean, at first glance, I don't, until you get used to these things, I, there's no particular reason to think this set would have a nice structure, but it does. It's in fact, an algebraic curve um, called the elliptic modular curve, uh, y1 of n. There are lots of ways to construct this. You can construct it analytically, you can construct it algebraically. And in fact, I mean, you construct it as a scheme. Um, and the points of that algebraic curve classify pairs elliptic curves with a point of order P. Um, and it's probably hard to overstate how important these curves are. Uh, they seem to come up everywhere. I mean, Maser uses them in proving uniform boundedness of torsion on elliptic curves over Q. And of course, the Kamieni and Merrill extensions of that to number fields uses modular curves. Um, that's not so surprising, maybe. These, modular ellip these elliptic modular curves classify elliptic curves with torsion points. If you want to study torsion points, it's natural to study them. Um, the fact that you can relate these modular elliptic curve, elliptic modular curves to things like Fermat's equation is uh, much less obvious, but they play a key role in, in Weil's proof of Fermat's last theorem. Okay. And more generally, remember AG was the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties. So people often study a principally, principally polarized abelian varieties together with a bunch of marked points, torsion points of orders, you know, some fixed orders. And that's a good example to keep in mind because that's the analogy. Uh, that's the thing that's analogous to, to what I'm going to do for, in the dynamical setting. So the geometry of uh, these elliptical and abelian moduli spaces um, are really important. I mean, in some sense, a lot of modern number theory, especially arithmetic geometry, the key is to understand the underlying geometry and then use the geometry as a tool to characterize the number theory. So for example, it's crucial that the genus of these elliptic modular curves goes to infinity. There's actually a relatively um, nice formula for, for the genus, just a little too complicated for me to stick on the slide. Um, but the genus gets more complicated grows as the order of the torsion point grows. So you would expect these curves to have fewer and fewer rational points. 
maybe, because they're getting more complicated, right? Genus is a geometric measure of complexity. And very vaguely, geometrically complicated should mean few rational points, right? Lots of theorems and conjectures along about those lines. And that, in fact, is in some sense what Mazur proves. Um, so if you wanted to try to prove a similar thing for a billion varieties, which is a big open problem, you know, that the, the torsion is, is bounded uniformly, um, you would first want to know that these moduli spaces are complicated. Well, actually, there's even a, a nice theorem due to Thai that if you take big enough genus, the moduli space of a billion varieties of genus G is of general type. In some sense, that should mean if you pick any particular number field, there are very few principally polarized abelian varieties of genus nine or bigger defined over that number field. What do I mean by very few? I mean that the corresponding points in moduli space aren't so risky dense. And that would be a consequence of Voidus conjecture or the Bombieri Lang conjecture, I guess. Of course, we, we still need better tools to uh, really understand the rational points on these varieties. But nonetheless, it's, it's good to know the geometry. Okay, so let me move back to the dynamical setting. Um, so if F is a dynamical system, so just a map from X to X, and you take a point, you can look at its forward orbit. Remember, that's just P, F of P, F squared of P, F cubed of P, and the points just kind of move all around the space. So we say that P is pre-periodic if it has finite orbit, okay? So eventually it kind of repeats. And it's periodic if it actually comes back to itself eventually. So for example, a fixed point is periodic with period one. All right. And in a very reasonable sense, periodic and even more pre-periodic points are, dynam are dynamical analogs, it's spelled dynamical, of torsion points on a billion varieties. In fact, one way to characterize the torsion points on an elliptic curve, or more generally an abelian variety, is that the torsion points are exactly the points that are pre-periodic under the doubling map, okay? Why not periodic? Well, points of odd order will be periodic for the doubling map, but points of even order will have a tail before they kind of loop, okay? So the fundamental problem is to classify, well, a fundamental problem is to classify the, iso classify the isomorphism classes of pairs now, where F is a rational map of degree D on P1, and P is a point, a periodic point of exact period N. So it makes an N loop. Or more generally, maybe having a certain tail length in a certain period. So, since, right, picture's worth a thousand words, and I think I've said at least a thousand words so far. Um, here's a picture of a pre-periodic point that has tail length five, so it, it has five steps before it gets into a loop of period five. So this has tail length five and period five. So rather than just classifying maps up to equivalence, we can classify pairs consisting of a map and a point where the point is say a periodic point of period N and F is a map of degree D as before. But we want to look at those pairs up to dynamical equivalence. So the dynamical equivalence here um, oh, I mean, it's not, uh, you, you can always look at the sort of the forgetful map where you throw away the point and then you get a map down to just the moduli space of maps. And we want to describe the geometry of these um, 
dynamical moduli spaces with level structure. So actually I'm, we're here, huh? What I forgot to do, I realized is I forgot to tell you what the PGL2 action was. So if phi is an element of PGL2 and we wanna let phi act on the map and the point, well, we act by conjugation on phi because we know that's the right dynamical thing. And then you have to let phi act by phi inverse on the point so that you map the point to something that's, that's periodic for the map. Anyway, so that's what, so the action on, on P is just the natural action of phi on P1. Okay. So the goal or a goal is to understand the geometry of these maps. A much harder goal would be to understand the rational points. Um, and in the very, very simplest case, namely maps of degree two on P1, um, blank Conci, Conci and, and, and Elkies um, did some computations. Um, and these are very explicit computations, but on the other hand, they're complicated. You, you have to be pretty clever with, uh, or pretty adept at doing uh, computer algebra type of types of computations. Um, so they proved that for small values of n, you get a rational surface. In other words, um, in these cases, this is just birational to some to a projective space of the appropriate dimension. Um, actually, I don't even have to say appropriate dimension, do I? Of dimension five. So they're birational to p five. Um, but if you look at pairs consisting of a map and a point of period six, then the moduli space classifying those pairs is in fact a surface of general type. So you'd expect there to not be very many rational points on it, that surface, for example, again, by bombieri lang conjecture, but we don't know that. The, on the other hand, they do find, um, in this case, they, they found some kind of bad. They found some rational curves, I think, and maybe some elliptic curves also that have infinitely many points. So this moduli space does have infinitely many rational points on it, as it turns out, but they're not so risky dense, uh, conjecturally not so risky dense. Um, so one of goals of, of the Vantage talks is to provide introductions and overviews of interesting subjects. Um, but another goal is to provide some interesting problems to work on. And I don't think I've actually mentioned any open problems yet. So now's the time to start doing that. So here, I originally put, put, wrote this as conjecture, but decided what the hell I'll make it a, I, I mean question, but I'll, I'll make it a conjecture. I suspect that, pretty sure it is true, that the, um, the theorem that they proved that M21 of six is of general type holds for all N greater than or equal to six. I mean, it's almost inconceivable that higher Ns would be less complicated, um, but uh, certainly not a, general, not a general type thing. Um, And even more generally, um, I would guess that if you look at maps of degree D with a marked periodic point of period N, then as long as N is bigger than some, some bound depending on D, then you'll get um, varieties of general type. Of course, the, these moduli spaces are no longer surfaces. They, they have higher dimension. Well, they have dimension uh, 2D plus one. Um, it would be really, really interesting to, to prove, prove either of these conjectures. Um, the methods that Ty used to, to prove that the moduli space of a billion varieties is of general type, um, don't, I don't think really would apply because he really very much used um, 
modular forms and stuff. Um, the issue, of course, is that these modulized spaces, one, are singular. So you need to blow up the singularities. And two, they're not complete. So you need to complete them. And the natural completions are also high. The um, stuff you throw in to complete them tends to be singular. Um, so you need to blow that up. So it, it, it's hard to figure out how to actually construct a, uh, a smooth model, or at least a model that's smooth enough so you can read off the Kadira dimension from it. All right, so um, since the NT advantage stands for number theory, and I've pretty much done all geometry and dynamics so far, let me mention a little bit of number theory. So Maser's uniformity theorem, um, actually is, is pretty precise, but, but this is a, a weaker form of it. It says that if you take any elliptic curve over Q, then every rational torsion point on that curve has order bounded by some constant that's independent of the elliptic curve, right? The uniformity is that C doesn't depend on Q. Uh, it doesn't depend on E. And of course, this has been generalized, Kamiani generalized it to quadratic extensions and some higher degrees and Merrell for, for all number fields. Um, but let's just, let me just look at the, the original, Mazur's original result. So here's an alternative formulation, uh, which in some sense doesn't say anything about elliptic curves at all. It just says, here's this family of curves, algebraic curves, they're affine, um, and they're all defined over Q. And if you take N big enough, the genus is getting bigger. That, that's easy, relatively easy to check. And Mazur's theorem says that eventually there are no more rational points. Okay, of course, the proof uses the fact that Y1 of N classifies elliptic curves with points of order N. I mean, it would sort of have to. Um, but the proof also very much uses Y1 of N. Um, well, first it takes the completion, which is usually called X1 of N. X1 of N is the completion. And then it embeds that in the Jacobian and then looks at the mordell Bay group of the Jacobian or more pr properly, a, a certain piece of the Jacobian. Um, but the geometry plays a very, very important role. Um, not the hardest part of the proof, but an important part. So here is a, an analog in dynamics of Mazur's uh, uniformity theorem. Um, and this again is a special case. I'll, I'll, I'll mention a general version toward the end. Um, let, let me finish this and I'll answer the qu question in the chat. Um, so the conjecture is that if you look at all degree D maps on P1 defined over Q, and you take any periodic point, then the period of that point is bounded by a constant that depends only on the degree of the map. It's independent of the point. Okay, so hopefully you can kind of see um, that these seem somewhat analogous. Um, and one can reformulate this dynamical uniform boundedness conjecture simply by saying that if N is big enough, where it, bigger than something that depends on D, then there are no rational points on this moduli space. Okay, so there was a question um, from, uh, Sarah Zurich Brown saying, is the dimension, uh, and thank you, Drew, for saying I should read the question out loud. <laughs> um, is the dimension of the Albanese of M12 of six known? Oh, sorry, this is from David, using Sarah's account. Um, is the al dimension of the Albanese? Um, Not offhand. I don't know it offhand. That's a good question. Um, I mean, M one two is um, is 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 um, 
is is just is rational. Um, yeah, no, that's a great question, David. I, I don't know. That'd be interesting. That might actually be approachable. Huh. Great. And of course, if it had a non-trivial albinese, then then one could uh, potentially get all kinds of arithmetic information off of that. That would be great. Good. So let's throw that in as a, another question for the talk. What is the dimension of the albinese of these uh, dynamical moduli spaces with level structure. Okay, so more generally, um, instead of just marking one periodic point, you can mark lots of periodic points and specify what their orbits might look like. And in fact, you might even mark some points with portions of their orbit without even insisting that it be periodic. So in dynamics, uh, these are often called portraits which is a, a nice name. Uh, there's also a name for them in graph theory, um, which I've forgotten. So it's, it, 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 it's some really cool sounding name with like four or five different cool sounding words in it. But in dynamics, uh, I'll just use the dynamics name, which is portrait. Um, so here's a typical example. And, and the portrait is the whole thing. Okay, so what is this portrait? It's got a bunch of periodic points. It's got a fixed point, periodic point period two, points of period three, points of period four. It's got some points of tail length two, tail length one. And it's got a whole bunch of points over here that aren't pre-periodic at all. And there are situations where, where it is actually useful to specify um, marked points with some period with some dynamical structure without insisting that they be periodic. Um, it's also frequently useful to assign weights to the points. In principle, I, I mean, you, you can assign weights to the point or you can assign weights to the arrow since in dynamics, there's only one arrow coming out from each point. On the other hand, you have to be a little bit careful because there may be points that don't have any arrow coming out at all. So a, an abstract portrait with weights is actually a four tuple. It's a set of vertices V. So that would be the set of all the dots. It's a subset of VW. Those are the dots that have an out arrow. So that would be everything except for this point. And then it's a map from the vertices that have out arrows. In other words, the domain of, of your map to, to V. And a weight function that assigns to each um, point with an out arrow a weight, which you can kind of think of as a multiplicity. Um, and you can get fancier. I mean, you could assign weights that are you know, in some more complicated space, but I'll, I'll just use natural number weights because I'm gonna think of them as multiplicities. And for maps on P1, I'll denote them the multiplicity or the ramification index. So if you're a dynamicist, you talk about multiplicity. If you're a algebraic geometer, you probably talk about ramification index at that point, it's the same thing. And then the goal is to classify well, n plus one tuples here, consisting of a map and a whole bunch of points such that the map F, when it acts on the points, looks like this portrait. Okay, and, and, and one can make this formal, and this is what I precisely mean, that F is a map of degree D, and you have a map iota that sends the vertices into P1, and this commutative diagram is essentially saying that the action of F on the vertices is exactly mirrored by the uh, map phi in your abstract portrait. And this multiplicity condition just says that the ramification indices of your map are at least as big as the multiplicities of the abstract portrait. Okay, the details aren't so important, but, but you get the idea that you can set up an abstract picture 
like this, embed that big picture into P1, and then insist that you have a map with marked points so that the action of F on those points looks like the picture. And again, we want to classify up to conjugation where you conjugate the map as usual and you conjugate the points. You, you have to apply phi inverse to the points just to sort of make everything match up properly. And a theorem, recent theorem of John Doyle's in mind is that if you take a portrait and you look at the set of all degree D maps with a level structure that looks like that portrait up to equivalence, then you get a, a nice moduli space. Um, and when I say there is a moduli space, well, I mean, it, it, it's a nice moduli space. It exists in a geometric quotient scheme uh, in the sense of geometric invariant theory where you can even do this over, over spec Z. So it works in every characteristic also. There's a minor caveat. If P is a periodic portrait, meaning every point has finite orbit. So it's, every point's pre-periodic. Then it, it works just as you'd expect. If there are points which you know, are not pre-periodic, you, you just map them. They go for a while, but you don't, necessarily force the last point to go anywhere, then you may have to be a little bit careful which ample divisor you choose. Um, for those who know geometric invariant theory, to construct a geometric quotient, you don't just need the action, you also need uh, to pick a line bundle. Um, okay, so that's just a technicality. And this theorem is really just step one, right? Fine, so now we have this, this nice variety or even more generally a scheme and we'd like to understand its geometry. Um, uh, Alain Levy's theorem says that if, if the portrait's trivial, if I just look at the moduli space of degree D maps, then I get a rational variety. So first question would be how much level structure do I have to add to get, get a non-rational variety? Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to move up to higher dimension and just show you what happens there. Most of it goes through the same. There are just a few, um, few added wrinkles. So what I wanna do is classify morphisms on projective end space. Um, so a morphism is given by a whole bunch of homogeneous polynomials where the homogeneous polynomials have degree D and they have no common roots in PN, you know, over some algebraically closed field, no, no common geometric roots. If you take all the coefficients of all of these polynomials, and there are a lot of them, you get an, well, an M plus one tuple. You get an M tuple where M is this, N plus one times this combinatorial symbol. So the coefficients of the polynomials defining F define a point in this huge projective space. But we don't want to take all the points in that projective space. We want to throw away the sort of Fs where this map has degrees smaller than D. So again, you have to throw away a hypersurface. It turns out there's just one hypersurface to throw away given by what's called the Macaulay resultant. That's not obvious either. Um, so we get this space of degree D, finite degree D maps of projective end space to itself. And now we can act on it by conjugating by automorphisms of projective space which are elements of PGL n plus one. So those are just linear fractional transformations, but higher dimensional ones. And that action gives us an action on this affine variety. And we take the quotient and the quotient exists as a nice variety. And in fact, as a nice scheme. 
And this was proven independently um, by Petsy, Sparrow, and Tepper, and again by Ellen Levy. Um, the, the proofs are actually somewhat different. And, and Alon's proof is more complicated, but also gives you a lot more information. Um, okay. But as we now know, rather than just looking at the space of maps, it would be nice to add level structure. And how do you add level structure in dynamics? Well, you take a portrait and you look at maps together with a portrait. And it's the same thing. I mean, there, there's, you know, you have to make minor changes here and there, but essentially the same thing happens. And this is what's in, in the paper that John and I wrote, that you get a moduli space of degree D maps from projected end space to itself with marked points that look like the portrait P. And that quotient exists as a geometric invariant theory, um, geometric quotient scheme over spec C. And a even more complicated problem since now capital N doesn't have to be one is to describe the geometry of these spaces. Um, we don't even really know the geometry of the spaces with no level structure. It, it, it's clear uh, that these spaces are unirational because there's, there's a natural uh, finite cover by a projective space. Um, but we don't even know if they're rational varieties. We only know that when capital N is one. And to ask an even harder question than the one David asked earlier, yeah, if P is complicated enough, um, for, or do these have non-trivial albanases? Do, we, do any of them have non-trivial albanases for that matter? Um, and here's a general uniform boundedness conjecture that, that that Patrick Morton and I made. If you fix D, that'll be the degree of your number field. Fix N, that's the dimension of your projective space. Fix little D, that's the degree of your map. Then if you look at any number field of degree capital D, any map of projective N space of degree little d, and you take a pre-periodic point, the, the, and, and you look at the number of pre-periodic points, it's bounded in terms of just the three invariants that it has to depend upon. Um, so in moduli theoretic language, what this is essentially saying is that for all number fields of degree at most capital D, if you take a portrait, uh, well, I should just really say a, a periodic portrait with enough vertices, then the moduli space has no K rational points. So these are essentially equivalent. There's actually a little bit of uh, additional work one has to do because they're, they're, they're field of moduli versus field of definition issues, but um, I won't go into those. And just a completely trivial result to indicate that the general conjecture probably is not gonna be so easy. If you take fields of degree one, namely Q, maps of, uh, maps on P1 and take maps of degree four, this uniform boundedness conjecture implies the weak form of Mazur's theorem. Um, and more generally, uh, th th this thing about Mazur's theorem is, is obvious. You just look at the doubling map and the elliptic curve and look at what it does to the X coordinate. Um, but for abelian varieties, it's not so clear. So for Cruden actually, it proved that this general conjecture for pre-periodic points on projective space implies a uniform boundedness result for torsion points on abelian varieties. This of course is a longstanding conjecture where the dimension one case is uh, a maser morel theorem. So I, Oh, perfect, just exactly two o'clock. So I very much want to thank Rachel and Drew for uh, inviting me to speak and thank everyone for hanging in there for the talk. And I'm happy to just stick around and answer questions if, if anyone has some questions. Thanks, Joe, that was wonderful. Um, uh, I have a question maybe to start. Sure. Uh, so I was wondering, 
are is that are the dimensions of these spaces known in terms of D and the uh, portrait, or more generally, is it um, in particular is it known when the space is not empty? Um, yes and no. Um, in our paper, John and I proved a lot of results about the uh, about the dimension. Um, for maps of P1, because in that case, a fair amount is known about the dynamics. Um, however, there are some subtleties about when the space is empty or non-empty. What we proved for maps of P1 is if it's non-empty, then it has the right dimension, essentially. Um, for higher dimensional, um, for maps of P2 and higher, um, I don't, I, one can guess what the dimension should be if it's not empty. Um, but I don't think there's very much in the way of theorems. And there's some case, some cases where you can prove that the thing is empty because they're just dynamical, um, obstructions. Um, so to take a silly case, if you look at a map of degree two on P1, uh, it has at most three fixed points. So if your portrait has four fixed points, you obviously can't get a degree two map that models that. Um, so, so that's how you can, you, you can sometimes prove that the thing's empty. Um, and there's also riemann hurwitz type obstructions. Um, but there are also some subtler obstructions where, where, which cause the space to be empty. Um, um, so I guess that's kind of a long answer to say for, for maps of P1, a lot is known for higher dimensions, very little. Um, okay, so there's a question uh, from Max Weinreich. Are there moduli spaces of rational maps in higher dimensions? Because it seems like then a portrait could also include information about points entering the indeterminacy locus of the map. Um, yes and no. Um, if you look at the set of all rational maps, um, it actually doesn't have a nice quotient because in fact, there are rational maps which are not in the semi-stable locus we're semi-stable in the sense of geometric invariant theory. Um, so if you want to concentrate just on the rational maps which have which are in the semi-stable locus, then you might be able to do something like that. Um, so um, I actually wrote a recent paper um, just on Henon maps, which actually shows that most of the Henon maps, which are sort of the in some sense, dynamically, the one of the most studied class of rational maps that aren't morphisms, um, that almost all of those are not in the GIT st semi-stable locus. Uh, so they're really not, it's not clear that the, these GIT modulized spaces are the right way to study rational maps, but there's lots of open questions there. Um, okay, question from Andrew Coben. Um, in the elliptic curve moduli problem, you only get a geometric modular scheme over spec Z after inverting two and three. Why don't you have to invert the degree in the dynamical setup? Um, no, I think in the elliptic modular, uh, for elliptic modular curves, they have models over spec Z. It may be more complicated. Um, and in some places, maybe instead of moduli scheme, I should say moduli stack, if that's what you're worried about. So, so probably a lot of this, this stuff I was talking about, one should really construct these moduli spaces as stacks instead of schemes, because there are automorphisms to worry about. But, but I think things work okay. Um, however, it is also true that in dynamics, if you're working, 
in characteristics smaller than the degree, um, things are much, much, much more complicated. Um, for example, in theatic dynamics. Okay, question. Um, Allison Miller, you explained the dynamical analog of the torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve. Is there a dynamical analog for the rank of an elliptic curve? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to give a qualified no as my answer. A lot of people have kind of thought of that. I mean, in some sense, the dynamics of a single map is kind of like the equivalent of a rank one elliptic curve. Because for example, if you take the, in, in, in fact, in the, in the rank one setting, you can really do that. I mean, suppose the, that E of Q is just rank one, no torsion, all right? Then look at the translation map from E to E that sends Q to Q plus P then the forward orbit of T sub P uh, of the R of, 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 of zero is of course, just ZP. Well, I guess NP, I, it's an automorphism. Anyway, um, so one way to get higher rank in dynamics in some sense, except it, kind of works weirdly. It doesn't really look like the number theory setting so much would be, for example, to take two maps and then look at sort of all iterations of all of the maps in different orders. And now you kind of get a tree. Um, so people do study these trees. There's actually been a bunch of papers in the last year or two on the number theory side and, and dynamicists have also studied these for years. Um, so that in some sense would be a higher rank kind of thing, but because F and G don't commute, it, it's very different from sort of, sort of the rank. So the mordell Vey theorem, is, there's no real analog of the mordell Vey theorem, which I think is maybe kind of like what you're, you'd really want. Um, by taking finitely many maps, I'm kind of saying, well, it's finitely generated. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's also, maybe to preclude or another question people often ask, are, are there analogs of um, HECA operators? And again, not really. I mean, that's right. That's the key tool for studying ellipt elliptic moduli spaces, elliptic modular curves, or abelian varieties, moduli spaces are, are, are HECA operators and their analogs. And the HECA operators come from the group structure on the abelian variety. So the object you're studying is a group. And that gives you HECA operators in some vague sense. Here, the object you're studying are the iterates of F. So it's only a semi-group. Um, and there's no real analog of, of, of that. Okay, how useful is the boundary for studying these moduli spaces? Is it, possible to, is it possible to prove anything using induction on D? Um, yes, people study the boundaries of these moduli spaces. And by the way, there are also, yeah, there are other compactifications. You can compactify using geometric invariant theory. Just take the, the semi-stable points and then the quotient will be compact just from, from general nonsense. Um, but there are other, quote, better or maybe more dynamical completions. Um, and people study these boundaries a lot and try, the, in some cases, you can say things about what they look like. In some cases, you just kind of want to know what happens to maps in certain families as they approach the boundaries. Um, and for example, Laura DeMarco, for example, is, is, is a real expert on this kind of, kind of stuff. So, so her papers would be a place maybe to start for looking at things like that. Um, and I'll mention something really interesting. Um, <laughs> 
one way that people have studied the boundaries of these moduli spaces is by um, looking at the points on the moduli, well, basically using Berkovich spaces of power series rings over the complex numbers. Because um, the Berkovich space sort of gives you more flexibility for studying degenerations. Um, anyway, I don't know a lot about it, but I thought it was really cool that people were using Berkovich spaces over power series rings over the complex numbers to study boundaries of moduli spaces from dynamical systems. Well, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? So the next talk will be July 7th by Nicole Luber. And, um, and the slides for this talk and the recording will be up in the next week or so. Thanks again, Joe. Thank you. Hi, everyone.